Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship and pray that through our gathering together uh, that the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts and our lives. And I pray that if this is your first time or first time in a long time, Babcocks, or that uh, you will feel the welcome of this community and you will feel uh, the connection that we have. I feel like there's an echo in what I'm speaking. Yeah, so I'm hearing something. I'm, I think I'm going to switch to this microphone. There's a hum and there's a, but I don't know anything about the hum. I know about the, the echo. I can fix that. Uh, today we are looking and continuing the sermon series I've been meaning to ask. Uh, and today's question is, what do you need? And of course, you know, uh, through the week you plan and you think about worship, for me, like an, an anticipation of what is happening in our world and what's happening in our lives. Of course, I didn't anticipate what would happen uh, in Buffalo. And so uh, today, it's kind of hard to stand up the next morning and think, you know, how could something like this happen in our world? Why does it happen? Why do people do stuff like this? And thinking in light of the sermon series and thinking of the suffering of the people who are on the receiving end of this violence, I hope that we can turn to God with questions and to trust that sometimes the questions are just as important as the answers, that there are no uh, easy answers in situations like this. Of course, we could uh, divide into camps and say, see, gun violence, see, it's people, whatever it is. But what we miss in the mix of uh, this kind of situation is that we need each other. We need to hold the space for each other, to understand, to ask questions, to be curious. How does this happen? Why? Why was this something that would even occur to someone who is 18 years old, motivated by hate? Why is there such a system of hate? And um, thinking of the question of what do you need, uh, I was thinking, you know, I, when, when someone is motivated by this kind of racial prejudice and, and fear and hate, you know, I want to ask, do you, what do you need? Do you need a community that's all white? Do you think your life will just be great once you have all your neighbors be of the same race? And of course, there's a judgment in my question. Because when we do that, we tend to close the door. We tend to close the door, but also thinking of the families of the ones who went to shop at the store and never returned home. Thinking, what do they need from us? How can we support them? How can we be there for each other? How can we be the healing hands and feet of Christ? So lots to think about, and I wish I had good answers to tell you. Here's how it should be done, but I do know that asking questions, coming together, holding the space, as difficult as the space is, there's power in that for us, and there is an opportunity for God to bring us healing. And so today I want to share with you a video. Uh, this is from an author who wrote a book called Being Curious. Meaning when, when something uh, happens in our lives, uh, how do we approach it with curiosity instead of judgment? Uh, opening ourselves to the kingdom of God and folding in our lives when there are challenges. So let's watch this together. Researchers tell us that kids ask between 300 and 400 questions a day. But that only goes up to age four. After age four, it drops off tremendously all through the rest of our lives. What happens to us when we get old? Why do we stop asking questions? Where does our curiosity go? Are we just too preoccupied? Or when it comes to faith, are we just afraid to ask questions that maybe we don't have an answer for? Jesus came to radically change the world. And when he came, he said this, Truly I tell you, unless you receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you'll never enter it. 
The amazing thing is he's inviting us to a childlike faith, but not only a childlike faith. He's inviting us to ask those questions, those curious questions that kids ask when they're faced with this immense and enormous and wild world. Becoming curious is a critical part of our life with Jesus and his life with us. I mean, in the Gospels, Jesus asks and answers somewhere in the neighborhood of 183 questions. And in doing that, he welcomes us to see maybe your questions, your rich and honest and holy questions, maybe those are more important than even your most unshakable certainties. Underneath all the layers we've created, We've gotten too busy, too preoccupied, too scared. We've worked so hard to keep mystery and uncertainty and curiosity at bay. And can we get back to that place? What if it's actually good for our faith to ask some very specific and very honest questions and learn how to do it well? So we might find out what it means to enter into the kingdom of God with this kind of childlike faith. We desperately need to recover this practice because I believe Within it, Jesus holds a great amount of life for all of us. So I invite you today to open your hearts, and especially in this time of heaviness, to be curious instead of reacting open the door for God to speak a new word to you and to our world. So I invite you to take a deep breath and allow the Holy Spirit to fill your hearts. And we will begin with the call to worship being led by Bev. Good morning. Please stand as you are able. Family of faith, this must be the place. This is the place for connection and growth, for community and hope. This must be the place for questions like, where are you from and what do you need? For whispers of, I've been thinking of you and I've been meaning to ask. This must be the place because all belong here. All are welcome here. All hurt and joy, needs and prayers, dreams and love are welcome here. So for our call to worship today, we are going to lean into invitation for connection. I want to invite you to take two minutes to introduce yourself to someone around you and to share one thing that has brought you deep joy this week so that we might begin our service with joy, gratitude, and connection. All right. Thank you. Now it's hard to rein it back in. (laughs) God is near. Let us worship holy God. All right. 
And for our first hymn, we will sing hymn number 466, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. I will have the words on the screen because a couple people requested those, but you may use the hymnals, the blue hymnals in your pews. We invite you at this time to share your joys or concerns. If you have a prayer of joy or concern, please uh, raise your hand and share it where you are. I have a couple of them. Uh, first, a joy. We have so the Florida people starting to come back. We're glad that uh, the Smiths are here and also the Babcocks are here. So welcome back to the land of cold. Yes. Uh, I also would like uh, prayers for uh, Tom Shubmill and his family for, uh, as his mom is on comfort care right now. Prayers, of course, for the people in Buffalo who are impacted by the violence last night and, or yesterday afternoon and, and the people who will be helping them and the whole sense of community that needs to be healed. Uh, prayers for Jean White. Uh, she's recovering from pneumonia. And prayers of, of course, continued prayers for Jeff Stevens as he recovers. Any other prayers of joy or concern? Yes. I have a, joy. a joy. Yes. Okay. Tanner Mountain. Tanner Mountain. Yes. He made it through the first thing of seeking notes, second notes for Tanner yesterday. Right. In Rochester, and the coach said that it's the first time that a potato boy has made it to. First round in a, quite a few years. Awesome, great. So we celebrate Tanner's accomplishments in tennis and Rochester. Is he playing today? No. No? Okay. They're, They're down in Cuba. Okay. <laughs> They're hunting turkey. Okay. They didn't need, you don't need to make an excuse for them. <laughs> I tend to, to invoke that feeling of guilt in people when I ask, yeah, what are you doing this Sunday? <laughs> And then they're like, ah, I mean to come to church, but we're glad that he is doing so well with tennis. I mean, it's amazing. All three kids, uh, they've done such great work with tennis. Yeah. And well uh, done for representing Batavia. Yes.
It will get better. We'll get it. We'll get it right. The prayer is is thanksgiving and concern at the same time for the words on the screen. I should have checked. The person that put them together was like, "Oh, I put them up." I'm like, "Okay," but I didn't check to see if it was from our hymnal or, you know, a lot of times from online there are different uh, variations on the same hymn. But yes, a thanksgiving for being inclusive in uh, using the visuals to help people with different abilities uh, to see and to hear. And I'm hoping that today, uh, those of you who might also be having a hard time hearing will be able to see uh, as well. So we give thanks to God for technology that helps us with that. Any other joys or concerns? We will continue with Bev leading us. Um, and so these, these, these are the words for us as we pray together. Again, invite you. There will be a time of silence at the end that you will bring your own prayers before God for, during that time. God of the here and now, how we need you. This world seems to turn upside down all the time. Our center of gravity feels off. In, in moments like these, we are particularly grateful for the care you offer through the people who ask us, what do you need? So today we give thanks for all the people who care. Gracious God, help us to be those people for others. Give us the eyes to see when our neighbors are in need and the wisdom to ask, what do you need? Stop our assumptions cold in their tracks and instead carve out space in us to listen. So gather us in and hold us close. Be with us in our waiting and in our praying. Be with us in our grief and sorrow. Be in our relationships that we might be blessed with friends who support us and that we might be the friends who can bless others. Amen. And now we take a few moments of silence. And we continue in prayer using the prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So today, asking this question of what do you need when life hurts, when life doesn't go as planned, or when disaster strikes, and thinking about that, uh, there is a level of discomfort with the question for us. Uh, we are more ready to ask for help with practical things, you know, if, do you need me to come and help you clean? Do you need me to come and give you, you know, a ride? Or do you need something uh, that's, do you need some food? I'm making some uh, food for those who might be grieving or sick feels like something that we can do, but when someone's needs are beyond our ability to fix, when we can't swoop in and fix it for them, it's, it's unnerving. So speaking of fixing, uh, there, I don't know if, how many of you watched the movies, uh, Toy Story movies. There are several of them. Any of you know those movies? Okay, so the storyline is pretty simple. They're, the toys are talk and play, and they're in this kids, Andy uh, owns them. So this is in Toy Story 2. Uh, one of the main characters, Woody, the cowboy, his arm gets detached. And this guy, Al, who is greedy and wants to send him to Japan to be displayed in a museum and, you know, he'll make a lot of good money, uh, he sees that and he has to fix him. So who does he call? He calls a fixer. And so this is the part when this guy comes in and fixes the toy, but the other side thing that's happening is that his friends are trying to help him. Oh, thank goodness you're here. Is the specimen ready for cleaning? So, uh, how long is this going to take? You can't rush art. Oh, no. It's closed. We're not preschool toys, Slinky. We can read. Hee <laughs> 
monkeys for display only. If you handle him too much, he's not gonna last. It's amazing! You're a genius! He's just like new! All right, so you get the idea of this toy is broken, and there are two different approaches presented here. I know I'm, I'm probably reading too much into it, but that's you know what movies do for us. They make us think. And so this one approach is that he wants him to be a good toy, wants him to go to Japan. He's going to make a lot of money out of this experience. Al has to get him fixed, so he has the fixer come in, and that's the expert that could just put the person or the toy back together. What about his friends? What do they do? What are they trying to fix? What are they trying to help with? They're trying to rescue him. They're trying to really rescue him mm -hmm. because they want him to stay with them. They know he belongs to them and to Andy, and this was going to be the worst thing that would happen to him. And so they're attending to his spiritual, emotional needs uh, for connection. So two different approaches, two different ways. And it's always hard to know when you're dealing with a challenge, when it's what it presents as, okay, this person just needs this and this and that physically. But there might be a lot more for that person. Uh, a lot of times, you know, in, in training uh, physicians or training nurses or hospital staff, that's one of the things they try to address, to say, you know, you're not just looking at the body, the kidney is not functioning well. You're looking at a person with a kidney problem. Look at the whole person, and it's very hard. It gets lost because you're looking at just the one little thing. And the invitation today by asking the question of what do you need, it helps us step back a little bit and empower each other to, to know what we really need. And sometimes we're confused about our own needs. Uh, I find it very interesting that science tells us that sometimes when we think we're hungry, we're actually tired or we're thirsty. You know, so check with yourself. They say before you grab whatever you feel like grabbing and eating, check, am I tired? Am I really hungry or just frustrated or thirsty or there's an emotional piece that I'm trying to deal with? Uh, it's very hard to discern sometimes what we're really needing, even physically. It's not always easy to know. Or sometimes we need uh, others to approve of us, but in fact, it's what we're longing for is to accept ourselves. Sometimes the people are so judgmental. You see them and they're all, they always have a critical word for everyone and everything. And these are the people that are really struggling the most on the inside because they haven't felt that peace, that acceptance. Thinking of the situation in Buffalo and thinking of the young man, what did he need? What did he really need? Did he even understand what he's really longing for? Uh, was there a space for him to ask, what do you need? What do you really need? What are you longing for? What's your spirit longing for? Um, and and it's it always interesting in those cases, there's a need for belonging. And belonging even to a hate group feels like a good thing. Sometimes people join gangs for this very reason. They have no place to belong. And they join the worst possible thing, but it feels like home. It feels like some people care about me and some people agree with me. Some people see the world like I do and it becomes this thing for them. So today we're going to look at a scripture story about uh, someone who suffered and the explanation for suffering and the reaction of his friends. So this is Job. Uh, always in the Bible, we refer to Job as the one who suffered the greatest suffering in the world in terms of human suffering. Lost his health, lost his friends, lost everything, practically uh, his family, lost everything that was precious to him. And even his wealth was gone. And so here he was in this deep distress. And now the story starts out uh, with this fairy tale kind of feel. 
once upon a time, you hear that. No, once there was a man that lived, once there was a man that lived in the land of Uz. And Uz is, in Hebrew, means um, fertile. So it was a reminder that this was, everything was going really well. We know how fairy tales uh, go. How do they go usually? They start with this wonderful thing happening, and then what happens? Terrible stuff happens. There's lots of challenge, lots of fear, lots of pain. But then people find their way through. Of course, life doesn't always like uh, end like fairy tales. But the idea is that suffering does happen in life. So this, this man is a symbol for all suffering, for all human suffering. And there are many ways to explain human suffering. Uh, some people blame the victim. Uh, they must have done something to deserve, to deserve this. They must have sinned, or God is punishing them, or they invoked this kind of on, them, on themselves. And then there is the explanation uh, of karma. What, what, how does it go? What goes around comes around. Then there's the explanation of there's the devil. Uh, we, we have this being of evil in the world, and we think, you know, it's, it's out to get us. Many different explanations. Now, uh, just a little note here about uh, the character of Satan in, in this scripture. Oftentimes, it, we think of more of images from Dante's Inferno of, of the devil, not biblical not really biblical, but it feels like it's biblical, but it's not. It's, it's based on uh, another work, uh, the Aeneid, by Virgil. And so those levels of hell and different places, different punishments for different sins, that's really not nowhere in the Bible that you can really find that. So in this, we hear about Satan. Satan was a concept that people spoke about, you know, that there, Satan was a title, more of the one who was the naysayer in, in God's court. You know, God is saying, there's no one like Job. He is such a wonderful man. But then, you know, there's that, always there's someone in the group. Have you ever been to a, group, a committee meeting or a work uh, meeting? And what, there's always someone that's a naysayer. You might be one of those people, by the way. And I am not trying to put you in the same category as that Satan. But this, this is the role, is to say, but have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? If, if Job was tested, now he's a wonderful man. But if he lost his health, will he still praise you? Will he still be a good man? If he lost his children, if he lost his wealth, would he still do that? And so into this story, into the story of suffering, so God says, you know, go and see what happens with this man. And so there's no explanation, an easy explanation for the suffering he was going through, except for that it was part of his journey of faith. And so we have his friends showing up. Now at first they do really well. So let's listen to how they react. Now when Job, this is from Job's 2, Job 2 uh, verses 11 and 13. Now when Job's three friends heard of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home. Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Nimethite, they met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one, no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Imagine these friends that are going to help they didn't bring their fixing tools to make it better. They, they, it doesn't even tell us that they brought any casseroles or food or whatever we normally do, flowers. They just came and they cried. They wept with him. They showed him that sense of solidarity with his pain. 
I hope and pray that that's what's happening for the people in Buffalo. No one is coming in with easy, with easy answers or trying to use their pain for political reasons because they need people to recognize the severity of their loss and the pain that they're experiencing. And so that's exactly what they did. They sat there trying to not explain, not to fix. Can you imagine seven days and seven nights? Of course, seven is a biblical number. We know it's, a, it's like a whole cycle. They sat for a whole cycle of time, saying nothing, just being there with that person. Of course, when they speak, that's when problems come. They start to try to explain why he was suffering. You know, he's asking, why am I suffering? Well, maybe you sinned. Why, why don't you confess? He's like, well, what do I confess? We don't know. We don't know any of your sins. We don't know. We can't see anything. But maybe you should confess just in case. Because they were trying to fix. They went into this mode, again, uh, that is very human, to, to try to fix him. And they forgot that all they needed was that ministry of presence, ministry of being there for the person without, without fixing, but with the opening of curiosity, opening with a question. And this is the question for this week. What do you need? What do you need? Meaning very important. Even Jesus did that. This is from uh, Mark 10, 51. Uh, Jesus encountering Bartimaeus, uh, the, the blind man. And this is what Jesus said to him. What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Now, Jesus, it was obvious what the man needed physically. He needed to see. But Jesus wanted to give him that chance to speak that for himself, to say, to say what he needed, to have an agency in what he needs. You know how sometimes you think somebody needs something, but they're actually needing the opposite or they, they're needing a space. And it's hard for us to know. Sometimes it's hard for us to know what we need, let alone knowing what somebody else needs. So listening. And the question itself is really important because it could hold the space for the person or for the group to really understand what they're going through. So the question can help us go deep to find out what we really need. A good example of this comes from Parker Palmer. In his book, Let Your Life Speak, he tells about a exper personal experience for himself. He is a Quaker, and so uh, he believes in, a, in discernment in a group, what they call a clearness committee. So this was at a time when he uh, got offered the job of a, of a president of a college. Now he's worked, at, at that point he had worked uh, his way up to reach that point. He had been teaching and writing, and this felt like a great thing to do. But something in him was saying, something is not right about this. So he called a committee. And this is just a group of people that would come and gather, and this is in the, in the tradition, as I said, of the Quakers, where they ask open and honest questions of the person that is wanting a discernment. So they don't tell the person what to do. They just believe. This is what they believe. Each of us has an inner teacher, a voice of truth that offers the guidance and power we need to deal with our problems. But that inner voice is often garbled by inward and outward interference. So listening in a group, he's telling them about the job, and the question was, what would you like most? What would you like most about becoming this college president? And he started telling them about all the things he wouldn't like. I wouldn't like leaving my teaching and writing. I wouldn't like the politics of the position. I wouldn't like not knowing who my friends are. I wouldn't like having to uh, pander to those who give money to the college. And this is when the chair of the committee stopped him and said, let's get back to the question. We want to know what would you like most about being the president of the college. So he had to spend some time in silence and reflection. And finally, with a quiet whisper, he confessed. He said, I'd like my picture in the paper with the caption underneath it, president. 
And that's when they, you know, they turned to him and said, can't you find an easier way to get your name in the paper and picture? And so it's interesting that, of course, he decided against taking that job because he realized it was all about his ego. It was not about his calling. He loved teaching and writing, and that's what he was called to do. He was not called to be an administrator, someone who would deal with the politics and the dynamics of everything. But it took that sense and space of someone asking, what do you need? What do you need? And for him to listen, and is a good example for us to ask ourselves with friends and being honest about what we need. And being uh, in that place is not always easy. Uh, Bev and I were talking last Friday. We were uh, going for a, a nice, beautiful walk. And then we had this uh, discussion came up about race. And sharing an experience where somebody had shared something um, very racist with, with her about uh, black people. And you know the frustration of trying to deal with that. How do you deal with it in the moment? How do you deal with it? Uh, somebody from the first ser service shared with me saying, you know, there was this one person, everybody else always complained, always played the victim. What would I do to that? Well, how could I get that person out of that mentality? I said, I think you can't. <laughs> in reality, unless that person wants to hold the space with you, unless you, there's an opening, and that's where the power of question uh, comes, this question of saying, what do you need? What do you need with this? I mean, when you're thinking these people, or you people, or whoever you are judging, or sometimes we judge ourselves in the same way, and so a lot of times when you look at it in reality, we're doing exactly the same thing to ourselves. Looking deeply takes time, takes courage, take, takes that ability to sit for seven days and seven nights in silence with a pain. And listening deeply takes time. So today you receive the, again, once more, hopefully, some of you may not have received them, but uh, the conversation cards. Uh, if you didn't, the invitation of these is to pause and ask questions of ourselves and of others that help us connect deeper, create that space. So think about the questions you received. Any of you are willing to share your questions? Sarah, you want to share with us your question? Share a memory of a time you tried to extend care for someone else but didn't give them what they needed. Ah. What do you wish you would have changed? All right, so share, share a time when you, want, when you extended care to someone uh, and you thought you gave them what, you, what they needed but you didn't. And how would you do it differently, basically? Am I, did I get that right? Yeah. yeah. So think about this, this question. When we reflect on it, when we reflect on, you know, did I really help that person? Did I offer them that space? Um, tough questions. Others? Others from the congregation? What, what are your questions that you got? Are they easy to answer? <coughs> no. Yeah. They help us reflect. They help us reflect and, and to share of with each other. And so take these cards. And if you didn't receive them, there are some still different entrances. Uh, take them and think about this invitation. And if you are watching with us online, uh, the sermon uh, transcript will be on um, our website soon. So again, think of these questions and think about yourself. What do you need? What do you need? And how do you live with these questions? Instead of saying, you know, I got to know what I need right now. It, it, it usually doesn't work that way. It takes time. So we'll end with a poem uh, about this. It's a short uh, f you know, a poem and, and with some visuals with it. But the invitation is to live the question. Live the questions of life. Life uh, comes to us with many mysteries. And our limited knowledge sometimes is a hindrance. You know, sometimes, you know, what, what's the saying? I know enough to be dangerous. 
uh, and the lack of curiosity or lack of openness and the acknowledgement that we don't always know, we don't always understand, and we need God's help. We need each other. We need that sense of openness, and especially in times of challenge. How do we grow out of those experiences? How do we find healing? It's through those spaces. So let's uh, watch this, and I hope you will, those words will speak to you about the, the openness to questions. from Macrina Widricker. Will you pray with me? It seems to me, Lord, that we search much too desperately for answers when a good question holds as much grace as an answer. Jesus, you are the great questioner. Keep our questions alive that we may always be seekers rather than settlers. Guard us well from the sin of settling in with our answers hugged to our breasts. Make of us a wandering, far-sighted, questioning, restless people. And give us the feet of pilgrims on this journey unfinished. Amen. Will you please stand as you are able and join me in singing hymn number 367, Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. And hopefully the words would be correct this time. If not, forgive me. <laughs>
you may be seated for the blessing because we will have the servant song after that. So friends, as you go from this place, if you ever ask yourself, can anything good come from this messy and human life of mine? Remember this, God is always whispering, yes. You were created in the image of God. Your origin story is one of goodness and love from the very beginning, and it will be until the end. Amen. Amen. Please share the peace of Christ with each other as you go in peace. <laughs>